the beginning was the river, New River, slowly flowing from deep in the Everglades to the sea. It got its name from a Seminole Indian legend that says the river simply appeared one night, overnight. It seems that for this city, Fort Lauderdale, things are moving almost as quickly. Ninety years ago, this area was mostly dense jungle wilderness. The early settlers were drawn to the river's banks by the crystal clear water, teeming with fish, as it was in 1793 when Spanish explorers found the first settlers, Charles and Frankie Lewis, and their children living somewhere along here. By 1835, only three families had settled along these banks, and that's the year the Seminole War began. The war came to the river on January 6, 1836. William Cooley, husband and father of one of the three families, was away for the day. His wife was doing chores around the house and tending the baby. The two children were doing their lessons with their tutor, Mr. Flinton. No one even took notice at first when the Seminoles pulled their dug up, up to the landing near the house. It happened right over there, across the river. Moments later, William Cooley's family lay dead, massacred. The baby was pinned to her mother's breast with an arrow. The children lay bleeding among their scattered books and slates. Mr. Flinton was scalped. The Seminole War had come to New River. The other families hurriedly packed up and left the river to the Seminoles and the alligators for two long years. That's when the shouts and clatter of soldiers rang along the river. Major William Lauderdale and a 500-man battalion of Tennessee Mounted Infantry arrived. They built an Indian fort near here at the North Fork of the river and named it Fort Lauderdale after their commander. If it was still standing, we could see it now. But Indian forts didn't really last that long. The Seminoles burned it within the year. There were other forts and other commanders, and although Major Lauderdale was only here for three months, his name stayed. The war ended in 1842, but the settlers had gone. In 1876, there was only one, a hermit pig farmer named John Pig Brown. Then in 1892, a stage line paved the first road through here on its way to Miami. It crossed the river by ferry here at Tarpon Bend. Frank Stranahan ran the ferry. Frank moved his ferry from Tarpon Bend to this point, the present crossing of the Route 1 tunnel, and built a trading post. But the road brought more settlers, and by the end of the century, they definitely needed a school. The county, then Dade County, sent an attractive young school marm, Miss Ivy Cromarty. Well, Miss Ivy struck a chord with Frank. They were married in 1900 and built this house. The rugged pioneer and the school teacher have become warm legends as Fort Lauderdale's most famous pioneers. Frank took his own life in 1929 by jumping into the river. His widow never remarried and lived to the ripe old age of 91, right here in this house. Mrs. Stranahan died in 1971. When they were married, only 52 people lived along here. Imagine the changes she saw as this river rolled by. When Flagler brought his Florida East Coast Railroad through on its way to Miami in 1896, Philemon Bryan with his sons Tom and Reed were supervisors for the laborers laying track. They stayed. Tom and Reed were a real dynamic pair. They were responsible for the development of Las Olas and Sunrise Boulevards. Tom was responsible for naming the city and was on the first city council when Fort Lauderdale was incorporated in 1911. He also suggested the name Broward for the new county when it was cut from Dade in 1915. The boys always had the fastest speedboats on the river, the first cars and airplanes. Edwin Thomas King built Tom and Reed's houses overlooking the river in 1904. Ed invented these hollow concrete blocks and made the blocks as he needed them. The roofs are covered with molded tin shingles. The boy's father, Philemon, became the first guest house operator, then the first hotel operator. You see, his house was next to the railway station. So he began renting rooms in the house. Soon he needed to add on rooms to meet the demand. Finally, he moved his house and had King build this, Fort Lauderdale's first real hotel. Ed built it with his concrete blocks.
Strangely, Ed used Dade County Pine for his own home. He lived here with his wife Susan and their two sons and two daughters. In addition to being the town's first builder, Mr. King operated a boatyard and was on the first city council. The house is called the King Cromarty House because its last occupants were Ed's daughter Louise King and her husband Bloxham Cromarty, Ivy's younger brother. Ed built the first schoolhouse for Miss Ivy, a classic frontier one-roomer. The booming little town soon outgrew their pioneer schoolhouse and the 1915 school season opened in this beautiful building on properly donated to the city by the Stranahans. Within a year of Mrs. Stranahan's death, the historic school was demolished to make way for the new downtown Fort Lauderdale, a bank building. The demolition bitterly divided the city. In 1924, they built Dillard, a school for black children. Separate but equal, of course. Soon, even more white classrooms were needed, so the school board built a school for each developing quadrant of the city, west side, south side, east side, and north side, then renamed the original school Central. It would later become the first high school. Each of the schools are quite unique, with very little architectural similarities. Each seems to represent its namesake area of the nation. West Side was built in a simple Western style. Its land was donated as a playground, dedicated forever to the plays of children. The obvious place to build a school. Now, it is a workplace for adults. The Broward School Administration. Things do evolve strangely. This was the first school I attended in Fort Lauderdale back in the 40s. As I recall, these archways were open then. And you could sit under this shed at a table in the cool breezeway and enjoy your milk and cookies. Southside School has the feel of the Navajo Southwestern United States. East Side is ultra-modern Art Deco, the style of New York in the 20s. It served the more exclusive, wealthier neighborhoods in the city. North Side is an amazingly eclectic example of Mediterranean revival. Notice the dissimilarity of its two entrance towers. Dillard, the black school, had six classrooms for grades up to the eighth, because coloreds weren't expected to want to go to school past the eighth grade. Oddly, now fully restored, it is on the campus of Walker Elementary, a magnet school to attract gifted children. It is also the only school in the city to be listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. The firehouses that the city built were as ornate and beautiful as their schools. This was the Southside Firehouse. It stands right across the street from Southside School. It is now being recycled as a lawyer's office. The West Side Firehouse in the Spanish style is still in service. In 1927, the Trianon Gardens opened for business, a grand ballroom. It became famous as a place to play in the South for black jazz stars such as Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. Today, as Brownie's Bar, it is the oldest continually operating nightclub in the city. 
Another kind of watering hole, the water plant out on Route 7, is the first public waterworks and is still supplying a large part of the city. I can remember fountains out front for people to bring their jugs to fill for free. My family used the fountains after hurricanes when our water supply was interrupted or polluted on our side of town. The old courthouse, when it still had its bell tower. Renovators in the 60s came up with an amazing architectural decision. They decapitated the old building and wrapped it with aluminum paneling, so it matched its bland new addition. The ultimate irony is that the old county jail has itself been imprisoned. Its windows peer out at us through the bars. January 8, 1927, the first Orange Blossom Special arrived here on the seaboard rails. Its arrival broke the Florida East Coast monopoly. However, both carriers were kept busy until the first airliner flew into Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport in 1958. Paradoxically, today the seaboard has the only passenger service west of town, while the Florida East Coast hauls slow freight through the center of town, regularly tying up traffic at every crossing. True to what was in the future for downtown, a bank built the first skyscraper in the city. They sold it to a businessman who named it after himself, the Sweet Building. It stands right at the head of Las Olas in what was once Theater Row, long a landmark for the downtown shopping area. Its present owners have restored it to its former glory. This street, Brickell Avenue, was the city's first business section. The entire district was wiped out by a fire in 1912, so all of these buildings were built after that date. This was the first bank building, the Fort Lauderdale State Bank. It now stands forgotten, only two blocks from the famous financial center of downtown Fort Lauderdale. It seems like only a few years ago that this street and Andrews Avenue, one block east, connected by Wall Street, were bustling with shoppers. But that was before the malls. The store's historical examples of a once vital downtown seem to be hoping for a return to yesterday, for shoppers that never come. These hotels were the elegant meeting places for businessmen and their clients who arrived on the trains right behind the hotels. The Tibbetts building was the bus station. The archways once framed open glass entries all the way around it. Andrews Avenue was the second business street to develop. Its stores are only slightly newer. They stand unchanged, waiting to be rescued. And the little street with the lofty name Wall Street boasted specialty shops. The hat box sold only ladies' hats. Sterling's the finest menswear. Now cars zip past as if that world never existed. Another fading flower the historical Shepherd Estate, a magnificent house languishing behind the overgrowth of exotic plants. Will it ever be rescued and maybe be recycled perhaps as a guest house or museum? Or will the Wreckers Ball and Bulldozer someday notice it hiding here? In the beginning was the river, New River, slowly flowing to the sea. 
It got its name from a Seminole Indian legend that says the river simply appeared one night, overnight. Roll on, New River, roll on.